Hello and welcome to Your Damn Jets. Uh, we're still continuing my series on my uh, primary CNS lymphoma. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about the hospitalizations that I had in the fall of 2020. Um, the summary so far is that I had visual problems since January of 2020. I had uh, an attack of lymphoma on June, in June 2020. I got my second opinion, uh, and the second opinion is this is not MS, so you should look for a second, for another cause, uh, probably vascular. Uh, and I also have a gastroenterologist looking at my liver because I have terrible gut churning. Um, I should mention before going on to specific events that I was... I don't remember what the timeline is exactly when I was authorized, but at some point I received authorization to get Copaxone because the the neurologist that was treating me at the local hospital here thought I had MS, and he thought he should put me on a drug for MS, and he selected Copaxone, uh, which is a drug with with very few uh, alarming effects. So for RMS you can take drugs that are more powerful than Copaxone. Uh, if you look at the statistics they do more than Copaxone for people with MS but they have serious side effects. Some of them for instance make you immunocompromised. Um, Copaxone doesn't do that. On the other hand uh, it's also less effective which in my mind made me also doubt the diagnosis that the doctor gave me. Uh, it's like, why are you edging your bets? Uh, if I have MS, then I have MS. Uh, why go with the medicine that is um, proved to not cause too many problems, but also not terribly effective? Um, and one big problem for me is that one of its side effects is that you can have heart attack-like uh, symptoms. So you're not having a heart attack but it feels like a heart attack with chest pain and, and stuff like that and that was worrying me. Um, the fact of the matter is that I did receive some syringes through the mail but I never took that drug. I never went ahead and ordered it. I was authorized for it but I never took it because I didn't believe that diagnosis or I wanted more I mean, if it had been confirmed, then it would have been confirmed, but the diagnosis was not confirmed, so I never took it. So, on September, from September 19th to 23rd, I went to the local hospital here and I was hospitalized because I was feeling weak and I had problems. Um, and... I told them, you know, I have a second opinion and that doctor doesn't think it's MS. They completely ignored that and they still treated me for MS. They gave me high dose steroids, um, which is bad for lymphomas because I remind you that steroids do quiet down the tumor um, if you have a lymphoma. Uh, and you're going to see later it's, it has an impact on, on what you can see on in, in tests. Um, so I was there from the 19th to the 23rd. On the 25th, I was out of the hospital. I had a meeting with Dr. Bhargava. And I explained what happened. And at that time, he said, you know what? If you need to be hospitalized again, usually it's not an emergency. Um, you still need to go to the ER to get seen by the hospital but you know um, it's not a heart attack I was not bleeding I didn't have a fracture or anything like that so if you need to be hospitalized again come to Johns Hopkins and for us going to Johns Hopkins it's a one hour drive if we're just taking our car versus the hospital over here is 15 minutes away from the house so there's a difference so he said come at Johns Hopkins if you need to be hospitalized again on September 27th I again felt bad and it's hard to, to explain how exactly I felt bad but I felt bad and I was hospitalized and this time I went to Johns Hopkins Hospital 
Um, and I guess I had to go through the ER again. And then they admitted me. Um, I did tell them to call Dr. Bargava because, you know, he was a, the one who said, well, if you need to be hospitalized again, come over here. And then we can expedite things. So what they did when I went there, they did a bunch of tests on me. Um, so they were still looking for causes of, of my problem Ver versus the local hospital. They had decided it was a mess and that was it. So I went to Johns Hopkins. I was hospitalized from September 27th to October 1st. Uh, they did a PET scan. And this is where the problem with the steroids come up because they did a PET scan and they didn't see anything. So after the PET scan came back negative, I thought, well, I don't have cancer. But I do have cancer. I have a lymphoma. Why does the, why did the PET scan not pick up anything? Um, I think part of the reason is the steroids I got before that calmed down the tumor. And I had a, a neurologist explain to me that the PET scans measures the activity of the body, and if and the brain is very active. The brain uses sugar. It, it, it the PET scan measures sugar consumption, so the brain uses a lot of sugar, and it's lit up on the scan. If you have a tumor, normally the tumor is going to be visible as another level of of activity, but if you have dulled the tumor with steroids, then it, it may not show up. Um, so the PET scan was clear. Um, I had the Wasserman protocol MRI. I don't remember what the Wasserman protocol is. How people at Johns Hopkins call it? There's another name for it. I think it's to it's a it's a an MRI designed to look at the the wall of the of the arteries in the brain to see if there's a defect there or something. Like that. It is very a very precise measurement tool and and the way it worked is like a, there were people doing the MRI on me and then there was Dr. Wasserman who looked at at my results remotely so it was somewhere else and it was somewhere else directing multiple teams <laughs> so uh, yeah I felt a little special usually my MRI is just done in one place with one one person and then they they, they record all the information, they send it to the, the radiologist and he gives a report. But this time, the do there was a doctor somewhere in a different room of the hospital talking to multiple different teams doing Wasserman pro protocol uh, MRIs. And um, so they did that MRI on me and uh, they didn't see anything concerning my arteries look fine. My blood system in the brain looks fine. Um, they did a second lumbar puncture, which as far as I know, revealed nothing. Um, and after all those tests were made, then the, there were neurologists that came into my, uh, my room to talk to me. There were three neurologists at some point that were together. And I don't recall that they were like like junior less like somebody junior learning how to be a neurologist. They were neurologists. They, those guys were experts, and there were three experts in my room, telling me that they didn't know what was going on with me, uh, which was uh, quite a bit scary. Because if you don't know what what's the problem, then you can fix it. Uh, and at, during that visit, I also had a retinal tear repair. And I saw a bunch of ophthalmologists also. You know, the, the eye problems were ongoing. So the Johns Hopkins put ophthalmologists on, on my case. and um, But they did a retinal tear repair at that time. Um, then I was discharged. Um, and they still didn't know what was going on with me. Uh, on October 15th, I had a fibro scan, um, which again, we were looking for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and as far as I recall, this came back normal. Uh, on October 19th, I was seeing an ophthalmologist again at uh, Johns Hopkins. I think it was just the... Uh, 
follow up to my retinal tear repair that I did when I was in on October 20th. So the next day, I was at home and I started choking and I was choking badly and then I started vomiting and we decided that it was worrisome enough that I should go to the ER. So we went to the ER of the local hospital here, not Johns Hopkins. While I was at the ER here, I became incoherent. Uh, my thoughts were normal as far as I was concerned, but apparently all the words that were coming out of my mouth made no sense. So I was saying, for instance, my wife tells me that I was telling her at that time to go weigh the car because that had some impact on my vitals <laughs> somehow. Um, and that's not what I think I was saying, but um, that's what came out of my mouth. Um, the doctor, excuse me, I have a news problem. The doctor decided that they couldn't do anything more for me there. And maybe he saw something, maybe he realized like, you know, he had this guy has a second opinion that is not, it's not a mess. We tried the treatment for MS, it did nothing. Uh, you know, I was back in the hospital 20 days after they released me the last time. Um, or 20 days after Johns Hopkins released me, or one month, uh, about one month after uh, I had been to that hospital. So he said, he thought that the hospital couldn't do anything for me and he sought a bed for me in a better hospital. Um, and he was checking Johns Hopkins because I had a story with them. And he was checking other places, but Johns Hopkins was slammed with COVID patients at that time. And they were telling him, we, we don't have a bed. Um, so he found a bed at Innova and on, on the 21st, the next day, I was admitted at Innova. And um, so over there, they did more tests, blood, blood tests. I had the third lumbar puncture, which didn't help them. Uh, but based on my medical history and the symptoms I had been ex experiencing, and I think the fact that the local hospital treated me for MS, but it didn't make any difference. And my symptoms were not classical of MS. And I remember what Dr. Bargava said that the MS is progressive. It doesn't come on and off uh, like it did for me. So there was a, a doctor there, Dr. Cohen, who hypothesized that I probably had a primary sinus lymphoma. And it was, was the first time, so that was in October. I don't know what day during my stay was there, but from October 21st to October 28th, it was the first time that somebody mentioned the, the possibility of a lymphoma to me. Uh, and Dr. Cohen was an oncologist, as far as I recall. Um, so, yeah, but, and they were, I was discharged with instructions uh, to arrange for a diagnosis visit either at Johns Hopkins or at Innova. I did it at Johns Hopkins because I had more history with them. I, I might have done it at Innova under, under different circumstances. I had entire confidence in the people at Innova as much as Johns Hopkins, even though I had seen the people at Johns Hopkins more than the people at, at Innova. Um, they also discharged me with an antibiotic because um, I had uh, apparently they tested my blood and they discovered, and then they weren't sure whether it was actually in the blood or it was something that they picked up when they poked me. Uh, but I was assured with an antibiotic that I had to give myself at home. And there's a nurse that came to my home and showed me how to do it and how to maintain. Because I had a, a line that stayed until I was done with the antibiotic and was going into my arm. Um, so I had to take care of the line. So she showed me how to do it. And then once I was done with the antibiotic, she came back and removed the line. Um, which doesn't need any surgery or it doesn't need you to be in the hospital. 
Um, and I should say that we were talking about the brain biopsy at that time because here's the thing. Um, and as far as I know, all my doctors, all my oncologists agree on, on that point is that to diagnose a primary CNS lymphoma, you cannot just do it by an MRI. I don't know if there are conditions where the patient's in, in such situation where they're just going to go by an MRI and symptoms. And, but normally you just don't go by the MRI. Uh, you have to do a brain biopsy and open up, open up the brain and go in and take a sample and then send it to pathology. We're going to do the tests on it and tell you whether it's a lymphoma or not. And in my case, they were, at that point, they were quite worried if they did a brain biopsy on me because my tumor, if it was a tumor, they weren't sure yet, but if it was a tumor, my tumor was small. It had been already uh, uh, dampened by the, the steroid treatment I had received. Um, and they would have had to go deep into the brain structure, into my brain stem to get, to get enough of the material. You don't want, because when you do a brain biopsy, you, know, you go in and you want to make it worth. You don't want to miss the spot and go next to it and then say it's negative when in fact it's positive. Um, so they, they, they were not yet saying, yeah, we have to do the biopsy right this moment. They were saying, you know, you need to plan with Johns Hopkins or us and to get the brain biopsy. But at the same time, you know, people might want to do other tests before the biopsy to see if they can confirm or not that you have a, a lymphoma through other means. Um, so... I was released with those instructions on October 29th. I saw my gastroenterologist again and he said my liver is fine. Um, and that was a whole wild goose chase because I think the churning itself was caused by my lymphoma who was in my brain stem and controls the, the basic functions of, uh, of the body. And... Uh, the elevated enzymes were caused by my statins and apparently nobody took advantage of that information that I'm taking statins for my cholesterol and it does tend to raise the the enzymes. Uh, the only thing I would say that, that we did a bunch of tests. One of the tests was a blood test and it was a formula. So, I, so they were taking a blood test and then they were plugging the numbers from the the blood test result into a formula that was saying, is it likely that this guy has fatty liver disease or not? And, you know, LabCorp is uh, clear about that test that you need to do other tests. You cannot just rely on that test for fatty liver disease. But that's the only test that I did that said, yeah, this guy probably has it, but I didn't. Um, the fibro scan came back negative. The doctor said, you know, you're fine. Um, uh, it was a white goose chase, I think, that was caused by my uh, lymphoma. And then on October 31st, I had my first meeting with my psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Khan. Um, and uh, I don't remember time-wise how it happened. Excuse me. I think actually the hospital... I don't remember at which visit, but the hospital put me on bus peron to deal with my anxiety so that I wouldn't have to take Xanax anymore. And Dr. Khan was a, was assigned to me as a psychiatrist uh, to, you know, because if you take medication, then you need reviews from time to time. Um, and also in October, uh, my wife and I uh, bought a car in that month. Between all the, the things that were going on, the hospital stays and everything, we bought a car, um, which I mentioned in the projects video. Um, it was a Hyundai Ionic um, PHEV, so it's a plug-in hybrid vehicle. Um, and we were very happy with it, but we don't have it anymore because 
I totaled it. <laughs> uh, which has nothing to do with the lymphoma, but it happened. Uh, so, lessons learned. Uh, the quality of care really matters um, when you're ill. Um, you know, I went back to the local hospital and they decided that they were right all along and they treated me for MS, which I think was a, a bad idea. Um, and I should have had gone right away to Johns Hopkins, but I... I didn't realize at that time that it made such a difference, I have to say. Uh, I thought the hospital is a hospital, they know their stuff, uh, but no. Um, this local hospital here that misdiagnosed me and mis uh, treated me for a disease I did not have, MS, um, I don't want to go there again for any anything, basically. you know, Future tests, well, I'm going to have a colonoscopy at some point. Um, and other tests, MRIs and stuff like that. I'm not going to the local hospital because I they completely bungled my case. Um, so, yeah, again, when you have something important happening and with your health, go to a place that has good specialists and not to the necessarily the most convenient place uh, relative to where you are. Um, so I'm gonna, that's enough for um, the hospitalizations. The next episode is going to be about the diagnosis. Um, so until then, I say goodbye.